What's going on, you think? Well, thank you for inviting me today, uh, Dimitri. I think we have to be careful uh, what we conclude based on the reports that come through the mainstream media, first of all, in the West. These uh, latest counterattacks are in a series of counterattacks that have cost uh, the Ukrainian forces enormous numbers of lives. Uh, we can't even begin to imagine how desperate uh, the Ukrainian army must be at this point, having lost close to 100,000 dead. And the only thing I can think of is that they are desperate to try and drag in the United States and NATO on their behalf, and so they're launching these attacks relentlessly in the hopes they can create the illusion of success. The truth is that these counterattacks achieved very, very little. Uh, the Russians are running what we would call in the West an economy of force mission in, in southern Ukraine. And uh, they've given ground when they thought it was necessary to do so. But in most cases, the distance when we talk about giving ground is the distance perhaps in this area between uh, Culpeper, Virginia, and Warrington, Virginia, Warrington, Virginia, and Manassas. In other words, 23, 24 miles, then it stops. The Russians adopt a new defensive position. The bulk of the regular Russian army is not involved in these things, uh, and they are building up for what I think will be very substantial offensive operations in the future. This is a very complex situation. I realize it. Uh, I particularly realize it because I live close to Warrington, Virginia. So I understand the geography, which you have just mentioned. And uh, uh, particularly, if you are talking uh, about areas which are not quite urban, uh, where uh, there is a lot of open space, which allows quick maneuver, uh, it's very easy to confuse a tactical success with strategic victory. Having said Precisely. that, uh, if you look uh, at uh, what uh, the Russians themselves are saying, if you look at uh, uh, Russian telegraph uh, uh, channels, they are filled, I wouldn't uh, hesitate to say, despair. Uh, a lot of people are almost as desperate as they were on uh, October 15th, 1941, uh, when a lot of people in Moscow were predicting uh, an imminent German takeover. Well, we know it did not quite happen, and we know how that war uh, have ended for Russia, it ended uh, in Berlin. Having said that, it certainly is not what uh, uh, the Russian high command have expected. It certainly is not uh, clearly the way they visualize the military operations. Do you think, first, that there were serious Russian errors of judgment, military errors of judgment, and do you think, assuming such errors took place, that the Russians still could repair the damage? Well, first of all, I think any, any army that has spent uh, many years in garrison and takes the field in large numbers to conduct uh, high-end conventional warfare is going, to, is going to make some mistakes and have some problems. I, I don't see any of those uh, really as being either irreversible or all that serious. I think people need to understand something, and I, I'm sure the Russian population is curious because uh, the entire approach to this campaign has been very different from what one would have normally expected from Russian military doctrine. But that's because this was uh, always designed to be a limited operation to, op to move into limited areas with the purpose of destroying Ukrainian forces. Now, that mission was largely accomplished, but there was a, a key underlying assumption, and that assumption was that Moscow would have someone to negotiate with, that there would be an interest in bringing the conflict to a close. I don't think uh, Moscow ever thought that the United States would try to turn this into a desperate situation for Russia. And the Americans have made some serious mistakes in this connection. They assumed that they could crush Russia financially and economically, and they didn't understand that Russia stood outside of that system. They, they've also tried to isolate Russia from the rest of the world, when in fact the rest of the world, minus Europe and North America, is largely sided with Russia. Uh, so I think the United States has uh, underestimated this. The other thing is the United States thought they could win 
by expel, essentially exposing millions of Ukrainians to terrible conditions. I don't think that's worked very well. I think the Ukrainians have suffered terribly. And under normal circumstances, I think this would already be over. But London and Washington in particular wanted to continue. So now the operation has to change in terms of character and purpose. And I think that's what we will see in the very near future. And that's the purpose behind the limited uh, mobilization of 300,000 reservists. <laughs> well, that sounds persuasive to me, but I have uh, one uh, uh, major concern. Uh, and my concern is uh, for those few uh, people in the audience who don't know you, you are not only a very distinguished combat veteran, you are not only a media star, you are, you are an author of five major books on military issues, uh, you are a very serious and original strategic thinker. And in that capacity, let me ask you a question. If you look at the G7, and G7, all these seven major nations are now with Ukraine against Russia. Their GDP together is 28 times of the Russian GDP. If you look at military budgets, their military budgets are 24 times higher than the Russian military budget. And uh, as you know better than me, at the beginning of the Ukrainian campaign, uh, there was some, uh, I would say, hesitation in the West, particularly in Washington, in supplying Ukraine with most modern, sophisticated, high-precision, long-distance weapons. This hesitation is still there, but uh, in terms of what is permissible without provoking Russia too much, well, I think the analysis is today that we can do more uh, than was uh, originally considered appropriate. How under those circumstances can Russia win if this war lasts for months or years? Well, expressing support for the position the United States takes is falls far short of sending troops uh, to fight in a war. There is no appetite whatsoever in Europe, with the possible exception of the Poles. Nowhere else in Europe is anyone interested in being dragged into a war with Russia. And right now, the support for Russia from, its, uh, from the United States European allies is shrunk to a trickle. Uh, it's drying up. And we are now reaching the end of our war stocks. In the meantime, the predictions that the Russians would run out of munitions, the Russians would run out of tanks, everything else, all that's nonsense. The Russians have plenty of ammunition, plenty of equipment, and the bulk of their forces have not been engaged. The Russians have never committed more than 20% of the Russian regular army to Ukraine. Again, that's going to change at this point. I think Moscow has finally given up on the potential for any negotiated settlement. And then there's another aspect that has to be brought into this, and that's the economic damage done by the sanctions leveled at Russia uh, to Europe. Europe's in a very serious position right now, particularly Germany. And frankly, Germany is the keystone in the edifice of NATO and the European Union. The Germans are furious. They're angry. They're frustrated. They don't understand what's happened. They're particularly frustrated with the Poles, who seem to be determined to find a way to war with Russia. I think we're going to see changes in, in the German and French and other European governments, a model of uh, Mrs. Maloney's victory in Italy. And I think these will change the strategic complexion of the entire event. And Ukraine, by the way, is going to suffer terribly as the winter wears on. And there will be no help for Ukraine from the Europeans or the United States to deal with that effectively. Uh, as you know, <clears throat> there are now uh, a number of influential voices in Russia uh, which suggest to Putin that he needs to replace his top military commanders, that they are unimaginative, that they are inept, that they do not know how to properly organize their forces, because in the past uh, Russia had a number of successful operations, but certainly on a much smaller scale. Uh, uh, if Putin asked for your advice, what would you tell him about the quality of Russian high command and whether he needs to do to them what Stalin did to his generals at the beginning of the what they call Great Patriotic War, when he essentially appointed 
totally different people uh, than were in charge originally. Uh, you know, Dimitri, uh, I'm not familiar with the personalities involved. Uh, and again, you have to understand what mission the Russian military was given. And decisions were made early on regarding what kinds of forces would be used and how they would be employed. As I said, I expected a very different opening phase of the operation from the one that we witnessed. I never thought that over the space of five, six, seven hundred kilometers, uh, piecemeal units of the Russian army would move in uh, to Ukraine. I, I was quite shocked by that. But I didn't at the time understand uh, President Putin's sensitivity to avoiding damage to infrastructure as well as to Ukrainians. Uh, he made it very clear that he was not interested in killing civilians under any circumstances. And contrary to what the Western media has reported, I think the Russians have exercised great restraint. Now, what has changed is the recognition that no one will negotiate. Europe is very vulnerable economically at this point. The winter is coming. He's now decided to increase the military power that he's prepared to employ. Most of the reservists will release Russian formations from elsewhere in Russia for duty in Ukraine. Uh, we're also seeing a lot of uh, forces come in with equipment and weapon systems that we have not seen in the past. So I think uh, at this stage of the game, Russia is winning. Russia is not going to lose. And we're going to witness offensives more on the model of what we have expected in the past but have not yet seen. And they will be devastating. The Ukrainians will not be able to withstand them. Uh, well, I wanted to ask you a question which perhaps uh, is no longer relevant in view of what you just have said. I kind of was operating on the assumption that it would be difficult for Russia uh, to prevail without uh, using some qualitatively uh, different weapons. And I was thinking, of course, about tactical nukes. Uh, and uh, if you look uh, at, again at the Russian media, at Russian official statements, there is an interesting dichotomy. President Putin said on a number of occasions that under certain circumstances faced with an existential challenge, Russia would use nuclear weapons, including even strategic nuclear weapons. But at the same time, there is clearly considerable hesitation in talking about this in greater details and particularly entertaining a notion that perhaps they could start with tactical nukes. Uh, I talked to a senior Russian official about a week ago, and I asked him about uh, a possible Russian use of tactical nuclear weapon. And he said to me, this is absolutely not going to happen. And they said, well, but Putin talked about using nuclear weapons. He said, Putin never talked about uh, using nuclear weapons against our Ukrainian brothers. This is unthinkable. And I said, well, but can't it become thinkable if Russia is going to be on the losing side? And he said, well, that's not going to happen. That's why he said we Russians are having this partial mobilization. It would take two, three months for this mobilization to start bearing fruit. And we have to be deliberate, he said, because if we mobilize too quickly too many people, we would have uh, no capability to train them and to arm them properly. But he said in, in three months we are going to be fine. Now, what would you think about this attitude? Should nuclear weapons, tactical nuclear weapons, be a part of our discussion in the United States of what may happen in Ukraine, or am I exaggerating? Uh, it's worse than exaggerating. It's uh, nonsensical. Uh, Putin has made it very clear on numerous occasions over many years that the idea of using a nuclear weapon against a neighboring state is effectively off the, off the table. And as the your Russian official pointed out, the Russians do view Ukraine as another Slavic country that is very closely related to Russia. So the idea of any sort of weapon of mass destruction like that has been off the table from day one. I think the nuclear scare is largely invented in Washington, D.C., and it's designed to scare the West, particularly West Europeans, into thinking something could happen that won't. The only way that a nuclear confrontation could occur would be if we, 
launched a nuclear weapon at Russia. We are not going to do that. The people inside the White House may be confused and disappointing in many ways, but insane isn't one of them. There will be no nuclear confrontation. There will be no nuclear warheads involved in this war. So forget it. Well, this is very reassuring. So you basically are saying that obviously we are dealing with something very serious, with potentially uh, uh, ominous consequences, geostrategic consequences for the United States. But we are not talking about like during uh, the Cuban Mills crisis. We are not talking about the likelihood of direct U.S.-Russian nuclear confrontation, right? Well, remember that one of the reasons, one of the chief reasons that uh, President Putin finally decided to move into eastern Ukraine was that we had reneged on our promise that we would not put theater ballistic missiles, strike weapons uh, with nuclear warhead potential on the ground in Ukraine. And when it became clear that that promise was not going to be honored, along with a, a lot of other promises, he said, we've got to go in. We've got to clean out eastern Ukraine, and then we've got to achieve neutrality for the Ukrainian state. I don't think that position has changed. I think it's the same. And I don't see anyone in Washington who is contemplating the use of those weapons. Now, there are people in Washington who talk about it. Fortunately, they are not in the chain of command right now. They're not in a position to make that decision. Ta the notion that you have something called a tactical nuclear weapon is dangerous. And this is something that the Russians understand very well. The use of any nuclear weapon will lead rapidly to escalation simply because the, the side that is the victim will conclude that if it does not use its arsenal quickly, it will lose it. So there will be no use by the Russians, and I don't see any evidence that we will do it. This war will be settled with conventional means, high-end conventional means, and many, many weapons that are very destructive, but they're also very precise. The Iskander missile, Kinshaw missile, these things are devastating weapons. Some of them have been used, but not to the extent that we are likely to see them be used now. But none of them will have nuclear warheads on them, and we know that. And how do you think this war is going to end? Would you care to make any prediction? I think that we will rapidly become absorbed here in the United States with our own internal financial and economic difficulties. The same people who think for some reason that you can hike interest rates, defeat inflation, but not cut spending, that you can still peddle bonds to the rest of the world when the Japanese and the Chinese are dumping our U.S. Treasuries. These people are also claiming that Ukraine can win. They're wrong. Those things are incompatible. Those things are not going to happen. The entire Western world is going to be consumed this winter with the financial and economic crisis that is developing. So that's the first part. Second part is the Russians are exactly what you said. They're deliberate. They're methodical. They're going to put together these offensives. These offensives will be launched, I suspect, uh, certainly when the ground freezes, no later than uh, mid-November and these offensives will sweep everything before them. And we, on the other hand, will sit there and say, well, we're sorry, we did all we could, and the Ukrainian people will suffer for it. One question which uh, uh, is very important in my view, and uh, for which I certainly don't have uh, a good answer. Why the hell were are doing all that on Ukraine's behalf? <coughs> it's very difficult for me to imagine uh, that uh, uh, reasonable and well-informed people inside the Biden administration really believe that Ukraine is a democratic country, really believe uh, that uh, when Putin is attacking Ukraine, if he succeeds that his next step would be go after Poland and to move all the way, I don't know, to La Manche. Why is Ukraine so important for uh, the United States? And why couldn't the United States uh, meet Putin halfway, providing him with assurances that Ukraine would not become NATO member anytime soon? Because everybody in Washington was acknowledging that Ukraine would not become a part of NATO. Why did we need to trigger to contribute to this crisis? Well, Dmitry, first of all, you, you've been with us long enough to know that we have no strategy. We simply have no strategy. There is no systematic approach that defines the desired end state, how to achieve that end state, and what the real purpose of the mission is. 
If you ask anyone, what are we doing in Ukraine? The answer is, well, we're degrading Russia to make sure Russia can never do this again. It's all nonsense. There is no specific end state other than let's see if we can destroy Russia. Ukraine is a is an opportunity for us. We'll intervene. We'll set up a government and then we'll exploit the Ukrainian people to weaken Russia and perhaps we'll be successful and we'll eliminate this obstacle to total global financial domination by the United States and the dollar. It's ridiculous nonsense. The World Economic Forum is part of it. The the people in the West, the, the elite class is part of this. It was a terrible miscalculation. It's not going to work. It's going to fail miserably and we are going to be in serious crisis. So the best answer I can give you is that these people were opportunists. They thought they could do something they can't. It's failing. It will fail. And the consequences for us will be enormous. I mean, look, NATO is in is really in ruins at this point. Anybody who looks at it objectively knows that the Europeans are not mobilizing nor have any interest whatsoever in a war with Russia. They thought NATO existed to stop wars in Europe. They thought NATO's purpose was to avoid future wars. They thought the EU was there to promote peace and prosperity across borders. All of that has been turned on its head by Washington. Washington is failing. It won't work. All we have to do at this stage, I'm afraid, is uh, take the abuse that we will from the mainstream media and from the politicians in Washington who will depict us as deranged traitors. But in the next 60 to 90 days, that picture will change tremendously. And when it does, we will do what we have always done. We will stop talking about Ukraine, change the subject, and talk about other things. Because in the final analysis, what happens in Ukraine has never mattered strategically to us. It's interesting you mentioned uh, that I was uh, in the United States long enough to know certain things about American strategic thinking. Actually, I was in the United States for 50 years. And uh, since uh, I met uh, Kissinger back in the 1970s when uh, he joined the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, where I was uh, a senior fellow at that time, uh, since uh, uh, mid-70s, uh, I assumed that one of key American strategic objectives was not to allow China and Russia to have better relationship among themselves than they had with the United States. Uh, uh, and the idea that the United States uh, would uh, uh, intentionally, or more likely unintentionally, uh, pushing Russia closer to China, uh, uh, everyone assumed, uh, who was looking at American foreign policy, that this is something that simply could not happen. And uh, particularly when you're dealing with uh, uh, Secretary of State Blinken, uh, National Security Advisor Sullivan, very experienced people, very well-educated people, uh, very, uh, I should say, familiar with global affairs. When the President of the United States uh, uh, was, as you know very well, for many years before he became Vice President, Chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, for many years occupied this uh, uh, important position, but also a position which allows you to be educated about global affairs. What in your mind are they thinking? Why they are doing that? Is it some kind of uh, blind momentum because of their hatred toward Russia, as many as human Moscow? Uh, is this some strategic plan we cannot quite understand? Or is the United States so big and powerful that we simply can do whatever without being concerned about serious negative consequences? Uh, Dimitri, I think your last point is a very valid one. I think that figures very prominently. Remember, the presidents that you referred to before 1991 were guided largely by strategic interests. Uh, it doesn't make any difference whether you talk about George Bush, Jimmy Carter, uh, Richard Nixon. Everyone tended to look very carefully at what the strategic interests of the United States were and what the strategic interests were of Russia, or the Soviet Union, and China. We have cast that aside. It is, it's a kind of blind arrogance informed, I'm afraid, only by ideology. The ridiculous notion that somehow or another, we are the vanguard of a revolution that is sweeping the world. 
And this globalist revolution preaches uh, the predominance of uh, liberal democracy. Not that I've seen very much evidence for that lately in my own country, but they preach that and they preach globalism as their uh, principal ideology. In other words, that we're going to denationalize everybody, destroy borders everywhere, and we'll end up with some sort of one world government. It's all nonsense. But I think that's what's happened. It's it, ideology has trumped interests. We've got to get back to understanding interests. And if we looked at ours, we looked at Russia's, we would understand that Russia has always had and always will a legitimate national security interest in Ukraine. And furthermore, if when you look at Russia's armed forces today, the size of these armed forces, it's absurd to suggest that Russia has any interest or plan to conquer Eastern Europe. It doesn't. It doesn't have the force to do it. So you can't have it both ways, Dmitry. You can't say on the one side, look at how incompetent and weak the Russians are. But, oh, by the way, if they succeed in Ukraine, they're all marching on Warsaw. It's absurd. It doesn't make any sense. We've got to get back to interest, but we need a completely new administration. Frankly, I think we need new generation of leaders in Washington. Well, it will not come uh, as a surprise to you that I do not necessarily agree with everything you said, particularly about tactical nuclear weapons, but you know about them much more than I do. But I overwhelmingly agree with your basic approach to foreign affairs. But when you talk to uh, uh, Russians, when you talk to Chinese and to many people in Europe, they would tell you that you... Uh, strategic realists in Washington, you have a lot of interesting ideas. Why should we listen to you? Uh, you don't matter much. There is bipartisan consensus in Washington that takes in the United States in a very different direction. And things are not likely to change. Whoever becomes the president in 2024, would you agree with that? Is there a credible alternative to the current American foreign policy? Well, first of all, I think it's important to acknowledge that whether you are in Washington or Moscow or London or Paris or Berlin, if you are not in power, you are probably irrelevant. So from that standpoint, I can't argue with your uh, position. Uh, I am not in a position of power or influence or authority. And uh, until I am or others like me, uh, we are stuck with what we've got. However, uh, you're asking another kind of question which deserves a lot more attention, and that is, can anything really change between now and uh, the fall of 2024? And I'll be frank with you, yes, I think it can. I think the reality that our resources are limited, the reality that we confront serious financial and economic crises at home and abroad, uh, this will operate as a very significant constraint on our ability to meddle in the affairs of others and to use military power as we see fit. Well, uh, as you know, uh, when uh, Trump was uh, uh, running for presidency in 2016, at first he was not taken seriously in Moscow, uh, but then when they understood his positions, in particular when they looked at the alternative Hillary Clinton, a lot of people, most people in the Russian establishment, sympathize with uh, Trump. They would certainly tell you uh, that no, they uh, uh, were not supporting Trump, they didn't do anything for him, but they still would argue uh, that Trump was a better choice. Well, and they were very bitterly disappointed uh, uh, when they looked at what actually happened with U.S. foreign policy during the Trump administration. And of course, you know better than me that a lot of uh, people in senior positions, even in the White House, were occupied uh, by people who fundamentally did not agree with Trump or even despise him personally. Do you think it is possible that if there was a new Trump administration or any other Republican administration, that there would be a serious substantive change in the American foreign policy? If if I am right, and the economic disaster that confronts us over the next two years is as severe as I think it will be, Dimitri, yes, we will see a profound change of course. Uh, you, you cannot sort of careen uh, like a car out of control down the side of a mountain. If you run out of gas, 
your brakes fail, and you can't avoid the trees and rocks there to stop you. So I think that's where we are right at the moment. We have careened out of control. We have set forces in motion we don't understand and can't control. And there's another feature to this, and that is, and you, you know this better than I do, most Americans today are worried about the damage done by the hurricane. Uh, most Americans are not thinking about Ukraine, and I doubt that large numbers of them can even find it on the map. The bottom line is that as the domestic unrest grows as a result of the financial and economic downturn and, and crisis that I think is looming on the horizon, it will be very difficult for anybody to do anything overseas except withdraw forces, consolidate their position, and uh, hope for the best here at home. But am I right? Uh, 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 I take your point that if you are not in power, in particular if uh, uh, your party uh, really doesn't control uh, not only the executive branch, uh, but even a single house in the American Congress, uh, then obviously uh, what you think is not very relevant. But there is a perception in many places uh, that it's not just a question of who is in power, but that the whole American foreign policy elite basically supports uh, the current globalist approach. Am I correct in my impression that there are a lot of people in this elite who actually have rather different views? And given an opportunity, uh, they would be prepared to articulate and to conduct a rather different foreign policy. Uh, you know, again, you're better positioned to make that evaluation than I am. I just don't know enough about the about the people that may be out there. Because let's be frank, most people are running silent or they are effectively prostituting themselves to the, the status quo. For the last 30 years, if you wanted to make a great deal of money and be successful in Washington, you aligned yourself with people like Madeleine Albright, Sandy Berger, uh, and so forth. Uh, th those people and their descendants or their clones are in power now. And I think that's why you see retired generals, one after the other, show up and declare their loyalty and confidence that Russia will be defeated and so forth. I, I'm simply saying I see a sea change coming. And whenever you get a sea change, uh, there are lots of windsocks in this uh, city. They will change direction, too, when they see that the direction of the political winds have changed and the economic winds. But more important, I think you will see new personalities emerge. The sad truth is that our system has never been a very good one for foreign and defense policy. We tend to lobotomize the government every four to eight years, as my friend Chaz Freeman likes to point out. Uh, but this time, I think you will see a true lobotomy. We, I think a lot of these people will be swept away in the disaster that lies ahead. And that disaster is not war. It's economic disaster. Well, this was not a very optimistic conversation, uh, but uh, uh, I'm very appreciative of your sober and penetrating analysis. And I do agree with you uh, with something very optimistic, that what we see today is obviously quite discouraging. It's very difficult for me, at least, uh, to look uh, at the current Washington with its uh, foreign policy establishment which is uh, predictable in a very, uh, in my view, non-analytical way, where uh, ideological cliché prevail uh, over a serious evaluation. But having said that, I agree with you on something very fundamental. I don't know exactly when the change is going to come, but for anyone to give up on uh, the American ability to conduct uh, a very different and much more effective foreign policy Everyone uh, who would operate on this assumption, whether it would be friend or foe, they are likely to be. They are likely to be quite surprised. Thank you very much, and see you soon. Thank you. Bye.